I've seen Americans swim with sharks, killer whales, dolphins, seals, and needlefish. Now that's got to hurt. But throughout the country's history, Americans don't want to swim with black Americans. More on this coming up. This is KRT, Critical Race Theory. It's not the one they teach in law schools, but the one banned in public schools. In Fort Lauderdale in 1927, African-American communities were unhappy with being constrained to a single colored leisure beach. It was an uninhabited and inconvenient strip of land that was inferior to the white beaches. It was not until 1945 that African-American leaders in Dade County began to plan action to challenge and draw attention to this injustice. On May 14, 1946, the Negro Professional and Businessmen's League brought a petition requesting a public bathing beach for colored people to the Broward County Commission. An integrated beach was desired, but they knew this proposal would be perceived as too radical. The county appointed a committee to work on the issue, but little came of the matter. The city of Fort Lauderdale tried again to address the request in 1949, and that went nowhere fast. Then on October 3, 1955, 100 African-American Floridians finally responded to the lack of action by piling into cars to Lido Beach to stage wait-ins. The city of Sarasota first responded without violence by placing no parking signs to turn around the caravans and by simply closing parks altogether. The county even built colored wading pools to appeal to waiters, but wait-ins continued. By September of 1960, the wait-ins started gaining attention. Following an NAACP lawsuit, a U.S. federal court reiterated that Miami's black residents should be allowed to use public swimming facilities. However, de facto segregation persisted as police did not enforce the court order and facility owners continued to discriminate. In the summer of 1961, local NAACP leaders organized frequent wait-ins on Fort Lauderdale beaches. Participants of all ages were recruited to join the campaign where they were met at the beaches by a threatening police force, axe-wielding KKK members and white beachgoers, catcalling and holding weapons. That resulted in the city filing a lawsuit against the NAACP and police arrested black waiters for disturbing the peace and inciting chaos. The NAACP sent its best lawyers and advocates and by 1962, a state judge ruled against white exclusive beaches. Then on June 17, 1964, the campaign had reached St. Augustine. A successful two hour long wait in by 35 people drew attention and garnered some black and white support. But on June 24th, white beachgoers did not allow waiters to reach the water by physically blockading the shore. Due to the court order desegregation, the police had no choice but to protect the black activists from the threat of violence by the white crowd, but they did not aid them in reaching their objective. That night, white groups such as the National States Rights Party conducted anti-black speeches and 300 whites marched to protest integrating the beaches. The next day, African Americans in St. Augustine planned to beat the heat and segregation by entering Monson Motor Lodge. It was an integration testing ground for Dr. Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. As black swimmers enjoyed the pool, the hotel manager poured a bottle of acid into the water and an off-duty policeman eventually jumped into the pool to beat the swimmers. Of course he did. The swimmers were arrested, but photos of the injustice began to circulate around the world, infuriating many as a symbol of barbaric racism. The St. Augustine movement was organized by Dr. Robert Haling, a dentist, civil rights activist, and NYC founder. Haling was an advocate of armed defense against the KKK, 
and that was something rare for civil rights leaders at the time. In September 1963, Haling and three other NAACP activists, Clyde Jenkins, James Jackson, and James Hauser were kidnapped and beaten by the KKK. Florida Highway Patrol officers rescued four men, and St. John's County Sheriff deputies arrested a Klansman for the beating, but charges against him were dismissed. And then Haling was convicted of criminal assault against KKK members. After that incident, Haling began calling for self-defense, and because of his stand, he would be removed as head of the Youth Council by NAACP leaders. Haling then turned to Dr. Martin Luther King and the SCLC for support as he and other activists began civil rights protests in the spring of 1964. From May to June of that year, protesters engaged in marches which were met by violent attacks from white segregationists. Meanwhile, hundreds of marchers were arrested and incarcerated. On June 11, 1964, Dr. King, who had come to St. Augustine to support the protest, was arrested at the white-only Monson Motor Lodge Hotel and Restaurant, which had become a central focus of the demonstrators. While in jail, King wrote a letter from the St. Augustine jail to his friend, Rabbi Israel Dressner in New Jersey, urging him to recruit rabbis to come to St. Augustine and participate in the movement. On June 18, 1964, 17 rabbis were arrested at the Monson Motor Lodge Hotel. It was the largest mass arrest of rabbis in American history. The rabbis wrote their own manifesto called, What We Want. On June 18, 1964, King and Haling rejected a St. John's County Grand Jury request that SCLC withdraw for a 30-day cooling off period. On the same day, black and white protesters jumped into the Monson Motor Lodge swimming pool. In response, hotel manager James Brock poured acid into the pool in an attempt to burn the protesters. And then police arrested the protesters as they left the pool. On June 30, 1964, Florida Governor C. Ferris Bryant announced a biracial committee to restore interracial communication in San Augustine. On July 1, 1964, SCLC leaders left St. Augustine. That was the day before President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law which prohibited racial segregation in public accommodations like the Monson Motor Lodge. The events at St. Augustine Beach in the summer of 1964 were a crucial turning point in the civil rights movement. The bravery and determination of the participants helped to inspire a generation and ultimately led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The end of one of many campaigns as we work towards a more just and equitable society. This has been Critical Race Theory. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe and share this video with your friends and family. I'll see you next time.